So welcome back everyone after our summer break uh, for the Phenomics webinars. Today, um, my name is Philipp von Gillausen. I'm from IPBN and with me on the panel, uh, not the panel, but with me on the team is of course, as always, Jennifer Clark. Hello, Jennifer. Hello, everyone. And from our team here in Germany, it is Lisa. Hello, Lisa. Yeah, she's... Hi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there she is. She will keep an eye on the chat, um, collect all your questions from there. So please, if there are questions, you are free to post them in the chat and they will be um, included in the discussion afterwards for sure. Um, a little bit background is always for our phenomics webinars, our um, organizers and also our sponsors. Um, the phenomics webinars was created out of the idea that especially during some of the soft lockdowns, uh, researchers and plant phenotyping practitioners needed a platform to exchange primarily and of course to educate themselves on different aspects and topics all around the space of plant phenotyping. We are still ongoing and we will of course also continue um, the series um, up to uh, 2021 and above potentially and therefore of course we are seeking always for uh, qualified contributions from all uh, aspects uh, and all work fields and all professional stages uh, of uh, plant phenotyping. <clears throat> so if your work or your research involves that, we are really keen on getting to know and you're free to submit to the um, web address below or just go on our website and you will find the link and submit your abstract there. As you already know, probably the Phenomics webinars are every second Friday at 2 a.m., uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Central European time. <clears throat> Our organizers are IPPN, which is the International Plant Phenotyping Network, whose uh, mission is to integrate um, globally the, the phenotyping community and to provide them a platform for exchange, knowledge, ex knowledge exchange, um, <clears throat> and to address certain topics within our discipline uh, through our working groups. We are organizing several conferences, workshops, and provide resources through our um, webpage, which you can see um, top right corner of this slide. Another one of our initiators is the EPPN 2020 project. EPPN uh, 2020 uh, is a European project that uh, organizes access to phenotyping um, installations all across Europe for which you can apply if you have certain experiment um, where you need some tools uh, that you don't uh, have or can provide yourself. You can uh, provide an application and um, then you will be potentially selected to have access to one of 31 facilities all across Europe, which will be fully funded um, and um, supported through this project. The next initiator is the Emphasis project, which will be an European infrastructure um, soon to be established in Europe. Um, which will also go beyond the initial idea of uh, EPPN 2020, but will take its work further. It also integrating um, field conditions um, in several forms, modeling and provide, of course, all the resources needed for a pan-European research infrastructure. I want to also thank uh, our partners. First of all, the broadcasting partner, the AgriX Forum <clears throat> for our Chinese attendees um, who will be able to join, I think simply by scanning the QR code uh, bottom right. And um, in this way, we will be uh, able to provide also uh, broadcast in China. For our broadcast here, in North America and uh, Europe and, and 
any almost any other region of the world. We are partnering uh, through our team member Jennifer Clark here with the University of Nebraska Lincoln, who is hosting the Zoom account through which the Phenomics webinars run. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> So today's speaker will be Roland Schafleitner from the World Vegetable Center in Taiwan, China. And uh, he will be talking about how phenotyping is uh, applied in the general context at the World Vegetable Center in Taiwan. A little bit uh, of information on his background. Roland did study in Vienna, first molecular biology and later on biochemical technology. <clears throat> And his work experience um, goes down to uh, have been worked uh, as a research associate at the AIT, the Austrian Institute of Technology, um, at INRA in Bordeaux, and then several years in Lima in Peru at the International Potato Center. His current work photo, uh, focus is uh, on applying high throughput geno and phenotyping in favor of um, vegetable breeding for tomato, pepper, eggplant, mug bean, okra, amaranth, and uh, pumpkin varieties um, in the recent years. So Roland, I would simply hand over the screen to you and I'm very much looking forward to phenotyping at the World Vegetable Center in Taiwan. Thank you very much, Philip, uh, for this introduction. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to this webinar. I'm very excited to be able uh, to share uh, our works on uh, phenotyping with uh, the phenotyping community. I need to say that we are very new in the field of high throughput phenotyping and you are going to see this uh, in the next, let's say, one hour. Before I start to talking about phenotyping, uh, I would like to introduce you a little bit uh, to our institute, uh, the World Vegetable Center, which is uh, located, uh, as you rightly said, in Taiwan. And our mission is um, to work on vegetables and to promote vegetable related technologies to promote healthier lives and more resilient livelihoods through greater diversity in what we grow and what we eat. Our, our job is uh, to conduct research and to, um, to promote vegetable, vegetable consumption, vegetable related technologies, especially in uh, developing countries. Uh, sorry, I unshare the screen for a second and uh, I need to arrange the slides again. I have a small, yeah, here we are. Uh, our work is organized uh, around uh, flagship programs. There is one flagship program that is called Safe and Sustainable Value Chains. Uh, this flagship program takes care of all vegetable technologies uh, from uh, farm to fork, is taking care of production, of pathology, and even of markets. Then there is a flagship program that is called Healthy Diets. I think this is pretty much uh, self-explanatory. Uh, here, our colleagues work on uh, promoting technologies and promoting uh, better food, uh, working uh, with communities on recipes, uh, creating demand uh, for vegetables. Then there is a flagship that is called Vegetable Diversity and Improvement. This is the, uh, the flagship program I am working for. Here, uh, we are uh, mobilizing vegetable uh, diversity for breeding high performing lines. All these flagships work with a gene. Roland, we cannot see the slides. I'm sorry, but we just oh, see oh. your face and not your presentation. I am very sorry. Oh, it's also nice to look at you, but certainly <laughs> with the information you are providing. You very much. It, it's better now. Yes, now we see it. Okay. Perfect. 
Thanks. Very sorry, very sorry for that. No uh, you see, not so uh, used in spite of COVID-19 webinars, not so much used in sharing the screen, especially not on this small laptop I am working on. Uh, well, you see now uh, these uh, uh, three flagships in the circle, safe and sustainable value chains, healthy diets, vegetable diversity and improvement. This was the last one I was trying to explain. And uh, all around these flagships, we have one flagship that is called enabling impact. In this flagship, uh, we work on prioritization of our research. Uh, we work on how we are scaling our research products. And all these four flagships together should help uh, the world, especially developing countries, to make better use of vegetable related technologies to create, generate more income and uh, better health through consumption of highly nutritious vegetables. I mentioned that I'm working for the flagship Vegetable Diversity and Improvement, so I have the pleasure to introduce you this flagship a little bit more in detail. Uh, the heart of this flagship is the world's largest private sector, excuse me, public sector vegetable gene bank. We are holding 60,000 accessions of around 450 different vegetable species. And we are using this diversity uh, for breeding. Uh, we do this by identifying germplasm accessions that carry those traits the breeders need. And we breed, uh, as Philip mentioned already uh, in the introduction, tomato, pepper, different cucurbits, besides others, uh, pumpkin, bitter gourd and lufa, legume crops like mung bean and vegetable soybean, and traditional African vegetables like African eggplant, amaranth, okra, etc. These vegetables are particularly important for us because they are highly nutrient dense, more nutrient dense than those vegetables that we uh, usually consume. So these vegetables are particularly um, suitable for interventions uh, to improve the diet of resource poor people. And we have a small onion program going on in uh, West Africa. I mentioned traits. Uh, there are so many things we can breed for. There are so many traits uh, that are in the gene bank. So how do we do our prioritization? Uh, to uh, decide on which aspects and on which traits uh, to, uh, to work. This has also, of course, a great impact on our work on uh, phenotyping. Traits are identified through phenotyping, so uh, we need to adapt our phenotyping pipeline to the traits we want to work with. In regular intervals, uh, we are uh, prioritizing together with our stakeholders. These are users, these can be seed companies, uh, these can be stakeholders uh, in the vegetable value chain. Uh, together with these uh, uh, value chain actors, we are prioritizing uh, the traits that we are working on. Here, these are a few examples for uh, tomato and uh, for pepper. It can be very rapidly seen that according to the stakeholders, the traits that are of greatest importance still are disease resistances. Very soon uh, come uh, uh, market uh, related traits, sometimes also consumer related traits, like shelf life and a few nutritional traits. And yield, yield is in both crops like tomato and pepper, not the first trait uh, that we are working on quality traits and disease resistances are more important. But very soon comes with both crops heat tolerance, abiotic stress tolerance. And uh, behind the scene, we see and we learn, especially when we do demonstration trials and we work uh, with our stakeholders in the field, we realize that overall quality is more important for vegetables than quantity, than yield. So a tomato, should not be just a bag of water. It should have taste, it should have minerals, it should have vitamins. So we are also focusing on nutritional value of our crops. Very important that while we are improving the yields of our crops and the disease resistance, that the nutritional value is not getting lost. So we have to capture these traits in uh, our gene banks. And trait capture for us is very often like uh, looking for the needle in the high haystack. Gene bank collections are generally 
very large, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 accessions. And it is logistically and uh, economically very challenging to phenotype so many accessions for traits of interest. For example, in, in PEPA, if we want to screen our collection of 9,000 accessions for a trait of interest, we need to check about 2,000 uh, 270,000 plants. This is a field of nine hectares. People active in cereal breeding, they might say, this is nothing. We are doing this, uh, we are doing a multiple size of this in many different locations. But the difference between cereal breeding and uh, vegetable breeding is that very often we are in the situation uh, that we have to take care of every single plant, pruning it, staking it. So it's a different effort to grow nine hectares of pepper than uh, nine hectares of cereals. So it's really quite expensive and quite laborious for us to screen this kind of, germ of large germplasm collections for traits of interest uh, for, for breeding. Therefore, it is of utmost uh, and, uh, importance um, to, before the screening, to check well what kind of population should be screened and whether it is really useful to screen thousands of heterogeneous gene bank accessions for a trait. One way would be um, to use purified accessions for screening. I will now uh, spend two minutes for explaining that. Uh, when we are holding germplasm in the gene bank, these gene bank accessions are generally generally quite heterogeneous. The reason for that is uh, the history, how this material has been collected and how this material has been regenerated. In most of the crops in the land races and in wild relatives, there is a kind of a natural variation. And gene bank curators try to keep this variation in these accessions in order to avoid genetic erosion, in order to maintain the diversity of the crop. So a gene bank accession typically is heterogeneous. This adds additional complexity if we want to screen for a trait. Therefore, sometimes it makes sense to purify these accessions before they are submitted to, um, uh, to screening. Uh, another way to, uh, and then there are several ways to narrow down the large gene bank collections uh, to uh, a germplasm panel of a size that can be handled easier. There are not thousands of accessions, but only a few hundreds. One of these populations would be a so-called fixed population, a focused identification of germplasm subsets. Uh, I don't, I will not talk about uh, in detail about this approach because I did not yet use it. Just briefly, uh, what uh, fix means is, for example, if I am looking for drought tolerance in a germplasm panel, I select this germplasm panel for accessions that are derived from regions that are prone to drought. Like that, I increase the chance that uh, drought tolerance is present in this germplasm panel because uh, it is likely that these plants during their evolution, during their history, have been exposed to drought and are used to these kind of conditions. But as I said, I'm not uh, continuing to talk about uh, this approach because I have uh, no personal experience in doing this. Uh, what we did and what we still do is rather to work uh, with uh, core collections. I will explain what that is, magic populations, I will also explain and introgression line populations. Let me start to explain the core collections. I said that our germplasm collections are very large. We have perhaps uh, 10,000 accessions of one species. Very difficult to screen. So uh, we take measures either based on, uh, on phenotypes or on, on genotypes in order to uh, elucidate the diversity of this large germplasm panel and we are selecting uh, accessions from this panel that best represent the diversity of the whole collection. This is called a core collection. Core collection is generally about 10 to 20 percent of a large collection and the mini core collection is 1 to 5 percent. Examples for core collection would be the following. Uh, Many years ago, we have started uh, to, uh, to work with mung bean and we have accumulated about 8,000 mung bean accessions. And we wanted to mobilize this diversity for breeding. 
It's very difficult to screen 8,000 lung beans, and uh, it's even more difficult to send these 8,000 accessions around in the world for multi-location analysis. So uh, we have used morphological data that has been generated in the history of uh, the accumulation of this uh, large co uh, collection together with uh, geographical data in a cluster analysis uh, to select 1,400 accessions that apparently were uh, representing clusters of uh, this diversity that uh, is present in the whole collection. Then we have genotyped uh, these 1,400 accessions at this time. This is long time ago. At that time, there was no mung bean genome. There were no SNP markers. There, we did not even know where these uh, SSR markers that we used mapped in the genome. And we used 50 SSR markers just to, uh, to look in the genetic uh, diversity of this germplasm panel. And we extracted 300 accessions that, in our opinion, would represent the diversity of uh, the large collection. At this time, I was very much scared that these 300 accessions uh, would not represent the diversity, but I will show you a little bit later how many traits we have already uh, identified in this germplasm panel. This paper, uh, this uh, work has been published a long time ago, and I wanted to acknowledge uh, Ram Nair uh, for the idea uh, to, uh, to, to do this work in order to mobilize the diversity of mung bean uh, in breeding and Abhishek Latour who uh, did the statistical analysis. Uh, in uh, the recent years, uh, we continued this work on generating uh, core collections together with a large Horizon 2020 funded project uh, called G2P Sol. There, uh, together with 18 partners in Europe and Turkey and in Israel and in Peru, uh, we have um, genotyped around uh, 20,000 accessions of tomato, pepper, and uh, about uh, six or 7,000 accessions of eggplant. And based on this genotypic data, uh, with the help of a bioinformatician uh, from Wageningen University, Richard Finkers, uh, an, an analysis was done in order to identify a set of the 400 uh, accessions that best represent this germplasm panel of 20,000 uh, in the uh, accessions. So we have generated these core collections. Another possibility uh, to generate um, populations for trait capture, for mapping, and for uh, for breeding is the generation of magic populations. For example, for amaranth, we have generated the magic population from eight founder lines. These eight founder lines uh, are very different from each other, and each of these founder lines contributes certain traits we are highly interested in. And we, 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 we cross these lines with each other in order to generate the population that recombines the traits of these eight founder lines in a way that has not been present in nature before. And this population then is ideal for mapping the traits. Trait capture in wild species is a particular challenge. It is not so challenging when it comes to the discovery of disease resistances, for example, or let's say insect uh, resistance. For example, uh, we, it's possible, it's still possible to screen uh, wild uh, species for disease resistance. And then comes the, the problem to cross these wild species with cultivated species and introgress the disease resistance into the cultivated uh, population. So uh, for the traits like uh, diseases uh, or, or disease or pest resistance, uh, wild species still uh, can be uh, phenotyped. But there is a difficulty to use wild species in the improvement of, for example, fruit traits or other agronomically important traits. This kind of traits can just not be phenotyped in the wild species because they are not expressed in order to see the potential of uh, the diversity of a wild species in improving traits of a cultivated plant, very often it is necessary to display uh, the, the genome of uh, the wild relative 
in the genetic background of the cultivated species. This has been pioneered in the 1980s and in the 1990s uh, by uh, Tanksley and Samir in, uh, in Tomato. And it is now executed, for example, by uh, Jaime Bruens in the group of uh, the University uh, in Valencia on eggplant. But these kind of populations are, are missing for many vegetable species. So these populations, as outlined here in the, um, in the example for, uh, for eggplant, uh, the blue lines represent uh, the genome of uh, cultivated eggplant and uh, the, red, uh, the red parts represent introgressions of wild eggplant through a coordinated back crossing scheme and genotyping and partly resequencing lines that define Define, uh, that display defined fragments of the wild species uh, can be identified. And this kind of population is an excellent tool for phenotyping and for sourcing traits from wild relatives of uh, vegetable species. So at uh, the World Vegetable Center, uh, phenotyping, in fact, is the bridge from um, uh, vegetable diversity to crop improvement, uh, crop improvement. We have our treasure, we have the gene bank accessions. We try to uh, discover traits in these gene bank accessions. We are forwarding the germplasm with favorable traits, either to pre-breeding or pre-breeding efforts. And uh, during uh, this, uh, this job, we also try to do some genetic and uh, physiological analysis of the traits map the genes underlying the trait in order to allow for mark assisted breeding and then we shuttle this, uh, these traits into our breeding populations and use them in crop improvement. In uh, the following minutes I would like to share with you how uh, this is and has been done uh, in, in, in our center. One of the examples of how the phenotype is what has happened in Bangbin for agronomic traits the last five or six years. Here, the International Mangbin Improvement Network, funded uh, by Australia and also in, the, in projects that were funded by other organizations, we had the, uh, the opportunity to phenotype our Mangbin core collection that I have explained and introduced to you a couple of minutes ago in many different countries. On the, on the map of Australia, Africa, Asia, and Europe, every mangbin represents a center or a country where uh, the mini core collection has been phenotyped. Generally, the phenotyping has been done across different locations per country and across different seasons. So you can imagine that this phenotyping job gave a huge amount and lots of very interesting data. The biggest challenge in this uh, program was how the data acquisition is coordinated. At each location, we needed to collect a comparable amount or a comparable quality of data. Then all this data needed to be stored and of course needed to be shared. So uh, this project would not have been uh, possible if, if we would not have uh, uh, established at the same time also the, um, the use of, um, of a data platform of a breeding information system uh, that helps us uh, to take the data in a coordinated way, to save the data and to share it. In this project we have used uh, the KD data platform uh, from uh, the Australian company uh, TART and uh, I'm very happy that uh, this has been done otherwise uh, much of the work would have been uh, of very little use if uh, in phenotyping, for example, different parameters would be collected and if the data sharing would not have been so efficient as it has been. So um, over the time uh, that we did this uh, multi-location uh, testing, uh, several dozens of uh, new traits were discovered in uh, the mini core collection. Here I show, I show just a few of them that uh, and a set like these traits that are, are represented on this slide are coming up practically every year. 
These traits uh, uh, include disease resistances like virus resistance, resistance to fungi, resistance to bacteria. It includes insect resistance. It includes resistance to abiotic stresses like soil stress and uh, developing uh, mental traits like uh, simultaneous maturation. Roland, yes. Entschuldige, wenn ich dich kurz unterbreche. Could you please um, speak a little bit closer to the microphone? Oh, okay. Is it better now? It is very, uh, uh, very sorry. I was not far away, but I, I realized that uh, the microphone is the weak point in, uh, in, in this laptop. So, right. uh, now it's better now. Thank you. Uh, this basket of traits, uh, a, a similar basket of traits, uh, we are sourcing practically every year from these multi location trials and they're using it uh, in grading. So the products of this, uh, of, of this breeding effort is a continuous supply of lines that combine disease and pest resistance with favorable yield traits. Uh, these lines are undergoing uh, variety trials in Asia and in Africa, and every year uh, we release varieties in different countries. So this program has been very successful in uh, improving access of improved uh, mangbin lines uh, improving the access of farmers uh, to improve the uh, mangbin lines. And uh, the support is continuing. A side effect of this support is uh, that we could uh, more and more combine uh, phenotypes with genotypes because uh, the mini core collection is densely genotyped. Uh, so we are continuously uh, performing uh, GWAS uh, in order to identify the genetic basis of uh, the traits. And uh, another effect of, uh, of this effort is that we got uh, access uh, to modeling. For example, we were trying to figure out in how far uh, flowering time is affected by envir environmental and genetic uh, factors. We had the opportunity to measure flowering time in different environments and different seasons, and we could associate genes to early and late flowering. And then we could ask which influence has climate on the action of these genes. So uh, this allowed us to model how would flowering time change with changing climates? How would uh, climate change affect flowering time? Flowering time in mung bean is very important because uh, mung bean is used as a catch crop between uh, cereal crops. So in many uh, agroecologies, there are just two months for growing the mung bean crop. So early flowering is a desirable trait. On the other hand, if the plant is flowering too early, it lacks the size of canopy that is required in order to produce enough grain. So the yield uh, is just not appropriate. So flowering time is really critical. It should not be too early and it must not be too late. So changes in flowering time are very uh, critical too. So this work allowed us to model which uh, flowering time is better for which environment, which genes are regulating uh, flowering time and how expected climate change scenarios will uh, change uh, flowering time in, uh, in Mangbin. But um, phenotyping is probably most important for abiotic stress tolerance. And this is something I would like to talk about now for the rest of uh, the webinar. Uh, currently at the World Vegetable Center, uh, we are working mainly on heat tolerance, a little bit on salt tolerance, against my will on drought tolerance, very interesting on flooding tolerance on different crops. So tomato, pepper, and mung bean on heat tolerance, okra flooding tolerance, and amaranth on drought tolerance. The salt tolerance on eggplant is a small uh, pilot project we do for a European uh, community funded project. So uh, we are uh, applying uh, the stress conditions in different uh, environments. Most of it is done in the field with all the drawbacks field experimenting has. Uh, for uh, drought tolerance, we're also uh, using rain out zones. For heat stress, we are using partially closed chambers and greenhouses. 
the populations that we submit are in most cases core collections. Core collections where a smaller germplasm panel is uh, representing the diversity of a larger uh, germplasm collection. Partly we are already working on breeding populations. In some crops we are working on magic populations. And the tools we are applying is uh, sometimes good old stone age, means manual evaluation. Then we are working very much on pollen viability. Then, uh, as I will show in a few minutes, uh, we have invested in a high throughput phenotyping facility. So we are using a plant eye uh, that literally allows us to watch the plants growing. And uh, at very small scale, uh, we are using uh, an app based uh, phenotyping tool. Uh, plant screen mobile that was developed uh, by Jülich. I will introduce it in a few minutes. I start uh, with the introduction of uh, plant screen mobile. Therefore, I introduce you first to our work on uh, eggplant uh, salt stress tolerance in uh, a core collection that has been established in the scope of uh, Horizon 2020 uh, project and uh, in this pilot project, we are just trying to measure salt stress tolerance at uh, the seedling stage. And uh, about two years ago, I met uh, Tobias Wojciechowski, sorry for the pronunciation of the name, uh, from Jülich in a, in a demonstration where he showed the use of plant screen mobile on small plants. And I was fascinated. It, for me, it was a, a quick and simple way to measure leaf area, projected leaf area, plant size, and, uh, and ideal uh, to do low cost, uh, simple low cost phenotyping. So we tried to apply this uh, in, uh, in, in our research uh, with the help of students. Just how does this plant screen mobile work? It has a training module. So first of all, this software, this app that runs in any Android phone that can be downloaded um, and the app can be downloaded uh, from uh, the Google store. Uh, it has been published uh, in uh, paper and plant methods. So um, after you download this app, you need to train this app in order to help uh, the system to find a segmentation method. The segmentation is important in order to distinguish between the plant and to measure the plant and not the background. So um, once uh, the, and you have three possibilities to, uh, to distinguish the plant uh, from uh, the background. One is a single channel segmentation, just one color, then greenness uh, segmentation, and the segmentation based on HSV, which means hue, saturation, and value on colors. Uh, so once you train the software, uh, the software is able uh, to uh, distinguish the plant from the background and it can calculate the number of pixels the plant represents and uh, the color values uh, associated with that. Uh, this uh, this uh, data can be calibrated uh, that, for example, from uh, this analysis you get automatically how many square millimeters of uh, projected leaf area is there. Uh, we did this on our eggplant that was exposed to salt stress uh, in the greenhouse. In addition, we measured uh, the plant height with a very cheap and very handy uh, laser me uh, measurement tool. And uh, these are typical examples that come out of this research. Just a comparison of two uh, accessions over time, how the leaf area and the top plot uh, is developing and how the plant height is developing. Uh, the blue line is uh, the control plant. Uh, the red line is uh, the salt uh, stressed plant. Uh, each data po point is uh, generated by measuring uh, three replications and uh, it shows that uh, there is either earlier, earlier or earlier or later a separation uh, between, um, uh, it's the other way around, earlier or later a separation between uh, tolerant and susceptible uh, plants. And at the end, there is perhaps a greater or a smaller difference. Uh, 
But the interesting thing is that uh, this cheap measurement allows to take many data points. And again, we can distinguish not just the endpoint, we can also see what's happening uh, during this time. Uh, we did this up to now only on the small John Blossom panel. In about uh, six weeks, we will have the whole John Blossom panel of about 400 accessions. And um, we calculated uh, a salt tolerance index based on the difference between uh, projected leaf area and the salt stress uh, and under control. And we found that uh, there are accessions that are clearly tolerant, and then there are accessions that are clearly susceptible. So this is uh, the first round of screening. Of course, the screening has to be afterwards deeper and has to relate to yield, but uh, this shows what's happening in the plant at the seedling stage. But more important uh, than uh, soil stress is, of course, heat stress tolerance. Heat stress tolerance, we mostly think of climate change, but uh, when we are thinking of uh, vegetables, sometimes uh, heat stress has a very immediate impact. For example, when you want to grow tomato in uh, South Asia, like for example in Bangladesh, during the permissive autumn winter season, you get almost nothing uh, for your tomato and the income per hectare is relatively low. But if you succeed to grow tomato during the hot and wet summer season, the prices are high and the income that can be generated with tomato is also much higher. So the problem there is uh, there are a lot of diseases, of course, if it is wet and hot. But there are multiple disease resistance, uh, resistant tomato lines available. It's not such a big problem. And just in case of emergency, there is also a spray, but uh, disease resistance uh, is something that is, uh, that is available. But in addition, these plants need to be tolerant to heat. And when we talk about heat tolerance in tomato, it is heat tolerance of the flower. It is heat tolerance of uh, the pollen. Uh, here you can see a few um, misformation of flowers under heat stress. And what is even more important is the male gametophyte where uh, the anthers or the pollen development in the anthers is just not working how it should work under heat stress. So we have invested quite some, uh, some work in order to find out what uh, make, uh, at, at which stage are um, of in, in pollen development is the male gametophyte most sensitive in tomato and the fact is that it is uh, rather in the early stage the trial stage this is here when uh, the plant is most well uh, this is here at, the, at this stage the pollen is most susceptible uh, to heat stress and then we also wanted to see in which stage we have to measure uh, pollen viability so we, we measure pollen viability over the flower development. We discriminate uh, viable from non-viable pollen. We check uh, the pollen to growth, and we try to correlate this uh, with uh, growth set under heat stress. You can imagine that this is extremely laborious. If we want to do this with hundreds of accessions, uh, this is just not feasible. The same thing here in, uh, in pepper. In pepper also we checked in which uh, type of flower is it best to measure uh, whether pollen is viable or not viable. And we identified uh, the stage, the right stage, uh, where pollen number and pollen activity shows the best combination in order to be measured simultaneously. We did this also with uh, hand staining. But hand staining, as I said, is too laborious. So we invested in this machine. This machine is dis disappointingly uh, small, but it costs about uh, the same price like a cheap Porsche. But we invested in this machine because it just allows us a revolution of heat stress tolerance screen. This machine uh, is a mi microfluidic uh, device uh, for measuring pollen viability and pollen number. I don't get into detail what is the, uh, the, the, the principle of the thing, but at the end, what is coming out is we get data on cell concentration and pollen activity. We can distinguish dead pollen from alive pollen and we can see how much pollen is alive, how much pollen is dead. Uh, we measured this 
across uh, quite a large number of uh, pepper accessions. We found a large variation in pollen concentration. This is our pepper breeder who's been added this uh, research, Derek Barchinger. And uh, he did the same thing and analyzed pollen activity also in this uh, large number of entries and found that in some germplasmic sessions there is a, a very high uh, activity of pollen also under heat and uh, some lose the activity completely. So with uh, the knowledge that we can apply this machine for pollen uh, viability studies, uh, we applied this uh, in a field uh, phenotyping experiment in Capsicum. And here you see another uh, time the two gentlemen organizing this trial, Derek Barchinger, our pepper breeder, and our visiting scientist from Korea, Sak Bong Kan. And uh, there were 400 uh, pepper accessions exposed to heat in the field, the average high temperature was uh, almost 36 degrees, the average low during the night 26 degrees, and under these conditions we saw uh, a nice segregation of um, heat stress tolerance in terms of pollen activity in our pepper collection. Here there are more the chilies, here there is more the sweet pepper, sweet pepper is more susceptible uh, to um, to heat stress when it comes to pollen. So, but we are not only interested in pollen, we are also going to see other growth responses in our plants. So, uh, we saw, we realized the need to invest uh, in phenotyping. And we had the choice between a field phenotyping system, between a controlled condition phenotyping system, or a drone-based phenotyping system. I think all these uh, systems are very useful and at the end I hope that our center will get all these uh, equipments but we gave priority to uh, a field phenotyping system. So uh, in May 2019 uh, we got our Phenospex field phenotyping system delivered and uh, during a week with extreme rainfall uh, the system was built up. The building team uh, in spite of uh, swamp and dangerous conditions, kept the time plan and have put uh, the system in place. And a few days later, we could already start with the validation trial. This uh, the phenospec system, uh, the heart of the phenospec system are uh, sensors. I will explain the sensors in a minute later. These sensors generate 3D data clouds of plants and are observing the plants over time and allows us to generate growth curves. Again, uh, this is uh, the sensor. The sensor emits uh, laser light. This laser light is reflected by the plant and uh, this reflection is measured and is used by a software to generate a 3D data cloud that represents uh, the plant. This 3D, uh, this um, laser reflectance is supplemented by capturing multispectral data. So we don't get only uh, the form of the plant, we also get color values across this, um, this form. This allows us uh, to, uh, uh, to calculate physiological uh, indices that allow us to distinguish dead from stressed and from healthy plant material. So in addition to the information of the size of the plant, we also get information about health and other parameters of the plant with this system. The data that are generated automatically by a uh, software that comes with the system uh, includes uh, morphological parameters and spectral parameters. The interesting thing for me for the morphological parameters is that uh, uh, the things like uh, plant height, leaf area, and these kind of things are independent of the angle of the leaf and uh, uh, the measurements are very accurate. Uh, there is a special uh, system based on laser triangulation uh, that allows uh, very accurate capture of these uh, of this data, often in uh, the millimeter or sub-millimeter range. And as mentioned before, uh, the system also allows to, uh, to uh, capture uh, color values, allowing uh, the determination of vegetation indices and other, other information. 
So the first job we had was the validation trial. We wanted to see how good performs uh, this uh, automatic uh, field uh, measurement system compared with uh, manual evaluation. And we did repeated manual evalu evaluation over time and we compared. First of all, we found quite a high correlation between what we measure by hand and what uh, the machine measures. Very interesting was that the hand measurement uh, among replications had a much higher error than the machine. So uh, it appeared that the Phenospex machine gave more accurate data of the morphology of the plant that we could get uh, by hand. The next job was, um, we did not want to use the system uh, during the summer because uh, in, in Taiwan during the summer is a tropical region. It rains a lot, there are typhoons. This is not the time when you want to do um, some, uh, some, some trials with plants, but uh, we got some money from, um, the local agricultural research uh, institute and uh, they asked us to do an evaluation of flooding tolerance during summer flooding and heat stress on okra and uh, so we risked it and we uh, we planted and we flooded the feed and uh, by being able not only to look at the end point of uh, the result but also during uh, normal growth then during flooding and then during recovery, we could see the different behavior of the plants. Those that develop well before flooding, those that still continue growing during flooding, and those that recover well. So this information allows us to select plants for breeding for flooding tolerance. Uh, in, in parallel, this experiment yielded some information on the correlation between biomass accumulation and yield. And it showed uh, that under flooding, uh, the nutritional value of oak is increased because of more antioxidants in the fruits. Then during uh, autumn, our seconded scientist from Japan was using the Phenospec system uh, to watch amaranth growing and uh, this, uh, this experiment was quite successful and he's doing uh, chivas now on two repeated trials on uh, the data that, uh, that were collected. But now back to the beta experiment, uh, which was uh, the last one that we have accomplished. We measured uh, traits like biomass, uh, plant height, and many others. And uh, what we are trying to do now is not only measure the development of the plant, but also to measure the development of specific plant uh, organs. On the 3D data clouds that are collected uh, by the Phenospex device, you can clearly see the establishment of the PEPA. And uh, we are trying uh, to develop uh, a software tool that helps us to measure uh, the development, not only of the plant as a whole, but also to separate between leaf and uh, the, the pepper fruits. So the results of this trial, now we have got growth parameters, uh, plant health, pollen viability and yield components. During autumn 2020, uh, we are repeating this trial under permissive conditions because all these parameters were collected under heat. In summer 2021, we are repeating this heat stress trials, trial and we are expecting to get new sources in pepper for stress tolerance breeding. The data analysis uh, uh, that uh, we, we implement is we try to figure out differences between stress and control across the whole germ plasm panel. And of course, we are interested in interactions between growth and health and, uh, and yield related traits. So um, the data integration is not yet done because we are still uh, in the data collection. We still need the autumn trial and the summer trial next year in order to can uh, to be able to make uh, use of, this, um, of these results. But just to conclude, uh, I would like to show you how uh, phenotyping now implementing also this high throughput uh, works uh, is, uh, is, uh, is done and is working. 
I mentioned already the gene bank. The gene bank is providing us with the diversity that we need in breeding. Here on this slide, you don't see gene bank, you see gene bank network because we are not working in isolation, only our gene bank. We are working with other gene banks across the globe in order to uh, complement the diversity that is accessible uh, for breeding. And we try to channel this uh, diversity that is uh, present in the gene bank through specialized populations and sometimes only through um, uh, direct use of germplasm accessions in a phenotyping platform. In this phenotyping platform, one of the most important traits will be heat, heat stress tolerance. And then, of course, uh, disease resistance like uh, resistance to viruses, to, ba to bacteria, to fungi. Then insect resistance will be a major trait. Uh, the infrastructure used uh, for screening is not uh, limited to the Phenospex uh, device I showed you that we have in the field. Uh, we also have specialized greenhouses and growth chambers for measuring uh, disease resistance and uh, we are um, now renovating our center with new research infrastructure uh, where uh, components for this uh, uh, phenotyping platform that are not yet there uh, in, um, in full scale uh, will be uh, set up. Then we are using genomics in order to map the traits as far as possible. And uh, sometimes when we are missing the diversity that is needed in breeding, we are also using uh, genome editing in order or gene editing in order to generate those traits uh, that we need. All these activities are accompanied by breeding IT. Uh, I just introduced you very briefly to the breeding information system uh, that we were using or that we are using in our Mangbin breeding platform. Uh, similar systems are used across uh, the, uh, the, the, the breeding programs in order to make uh, best use of uh, the data that are generated and uh, avoiding data loss. And uh, the output of this, uh, of this uh, research program are traits, traits for breeding, traits for breeding for us and for our partners. And uh, breeding lines uh, for us and for our partners to be tested uh, in our target countries uh, in order to develop uh, varieties, varieties like open pollinated varieties. And now we are also working on hybrid parents and on hybrids. And all these materials together with scaling partners, uh, we are bringing to the farmers in order to mobilize the potential vegetables have to generate more prosperity and health uh, for the people. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I would like to acknowledge uh, the donors who make uh, this work at the World Vegetable Center and partner organizations possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roland. This was a very extensive crosscut through what you are doing. Certainly not everything World Vegetable Center is doing, but it gave us a very nice uh, glimpse into what's happening and how you're using phenotyping and genotyping in order to come up with improved varieties. Thank you, therefore. And we are happily taking questions. So in that sense, <clears throat> one of the one of the question was um, on the software that you used for image segmentation um, with your with your small phenotyping digital phenotyping um, apparatus. Can you recall? Is it uh, it looked like image J? Um, it, it is possible. Uh, for, you mean for the training of uh, PSM? Yeah. The training of PSM needs just the information what is um, a plant and what is not a plant. And you can uh, use, uh, or we discovered that it is possible to use any uh, image editor uh, you have at hand. Image J is possible, but uh, you, can, uh, you can use any other uh, method where you can pixel out the background. All you that need is to the do important is to part, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, in that sense, also Photoshop, uh, Adobe Illustrator or common uh, video, um, picture editing tools would be um, helpful there. <clears throat> yes. 
Then there's a, a question from uh, Damoda Pudial. Sorry if I pronounce it the uh, wrong way. Um, and he is asking, or she is asking, um, whether there are certain programs for, let's say, short-term scientific missions with the uh, uh, World Vegetable Center. So a program in which um, students or practitioners can, can um, apply to um, that, that takes uh, over, um, let's say, um, a portion of the cost or that is funding some kind of uh, research stay in order to work uh, with you at, uh, at World Vegetable Farm uh, Trust. Is there uh, a program? Thank you very much for this question. Yes, there is a program. On the slide that you can hopefully see now at uh, the right side at the bottom, there is our web address. It is either www.avrdc.org or worldwatch.org. Both uh, should work. On the jobs, uh, there is uh, information how uh, somebody can join us. So uh, we consider ourselves as an open science center. We are very small. We have many different locations across the world. And in all of these locations, uh, we are welcoming visiting scientists, we are welcoming students. And uh, for students, there is a fellowship program. This fellowship program is targeted uh, to, uh, or is prioritized, let's say, to certain countries, developing countries, developing countries in special parts of the world uh, for which we get funding for these fellowships and uh, we are receiving students and uh, the re students have uh, the fellowship and uh, they get also some of the travel costs uh, reimbursed. In addition, in addition, we have uh, projects and in these projects, uh, sometimes we have the possibility to welcome students uh, in our institute. So please uh, check the web page, you will find uh, the possibilities. Just one word about uh, the present situation. Uh, due to COVID-19, uh, it is not possible to bring in stu uh, students now from other countries. So mm -hmm. I would uh, anticipate that we can start this program again by July 2021. All right. <clears throat> so there's uh, one question from uh, Paul McMahon, and he is asking on how was your experience with the support and service uh, from Phenospex after the system purchased? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I am absolutely biased uh, for this question because I'm extremely excited about how everything worked. Um, first of all, we did not have much requirement uh, for service because uh, the system was started we got training and the only thing that happened uh, was that due to extreme heat and extreme cold, the rail uh, fixing uh, had a small problem. Uh, mm -hmm. We called Phenospex and uh, I think it was on the next day that uh, the repair team was here and with several crews with a hammer, uh, it was repaired. Then uh, there is a service person about 300 kilometers away from us and about uh, five minutes away uh, per email who is helping us with all questions of uh, data analysis. So I think uh, with the service contract that is offered by Phenospex, uh, the clients uh, have excellent access to this technology without any worry. <laughs> Very good. Um, it is nice to see when things go clean and uh, straightforward and where's, when there's uh, sufficient support because often these machines are not trivial to operate and especially um, handling those large data amounts can be quite, quite a challenge if you're not used to it. And then of course it needs proper um, service in order to, to get starting. Uh, it is nice to see that this happened in a very short amount of time. But because, excuse me, because you mentioned the large data amount. I was not explaining this uh, when I was explaining uh, Phenospex. Uh, everybody and also me, we were thinking that uh, there is a large amount of data and this will generate a lot of challenges. This is just not true. 
the program comes, or the, the system comes with a software that is called flood control, that is uh, at the great, great part automatically uh, transforming uh, this large amount of data into data that can be handled even by a lay person. I was growing up in a time when computers were not yet uh, invented, and even I can handle this system. Of course, we have now hired a data specialist, but this data specialist will work on many other topics. We'll also work on panel specs. But in fact, the, the system is built to handle this large amount of data in a way that is very human. All right. Um, then we have a question uh, again from Damoda. And um, it says uh, that um, he or she is also a PhD candidate working in a plant, in a plant phenotopic pro, um, project with uh, chili peppers. And um, the question is, is there any access to more chili lines um, from AVRDC to be provided for as testing material? So can, uh, yes. can AVRDC provide lines for other researchers to, to be tested? Yes, we do. Uh, this is one of our, um, of our, of our jobs, in fact. Um, we have uh, about uh, 8,000 or 9,000 uh, Chilean speed pepper accessions in our gene bank that are accessible with a standard material uh, agreement under FAO. That means uh, they are freely accessible. Um, uh, free does not mean that uh, there are there are no costs associated with it, uh, and there are breeding lines that are accessible through our web page in a in a uh, in a seed catalog, and uh, there is more material uh, that is in the pipeline that can be accessed uh, through our pepper breeder. So, dependent where uh, the need Anita's lab is um, located in a developing country or in a developed country, they are either moderate or very low costs to uh, access uh, to this material. So again, through the web page, uh, there is a menu point that is called seed, and there it is explained how to access uh, the seed. The gene bank uh, comes uh, with a database, which is online uh, accessible through our web page. Uh, that can be searched, and uh, I'm sure that Danita will find some interesting material there uh, that uh, could help the research. Okay, <clears throat> a little addition. Um, it has already been answered through the chat, but I'm uh, happy to take it up here once more. Um, the link to the breeder position Roland was talking about uh, was posted in the chat. It can be found, I think, over the AVRDC uh, webpage under open positions, right, Roland? This is correct, yes. Yes, and- uh, We post all our jobs uh, there on this, on, on the webpage. Please yes. visit this uh, page regularly if you are looking for employment. Yes, and uh, Roland, of course, you are also welcome if there's any opening in our direction, um, so in the plant phenotyping direction or related, um, then we are also very happy to host this on our homepage um, and to in increase the range thereby a little bit. Um, Thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, then uh, another question was on the avail uh, availability of uh, the video recording for today's webinar. It will be um, uh, broadcasted or it will be uploaded to our YouTube, to the IPPN YouTube account. Please also visit there regularly. All our Phenomics webinars have been uploaded there um, so far and we will continue to do so. So then I have a question. So after taking up um, high throughput plant phenotyping uh, by means of your, of your Phenospecs device, what has improved your work, especially in comparison to the phenotyping uh, that you did before those HTTP systems? Mm -hmm. Yes, the improvement uh, was, um, the first improvement is the throughput. Uh, our field is designed uh, for accommodating around uh, three to 400 accessions. This throughput was uh, impossible to attain 
for most uh, phenotypings when something more complex uh, than plant dead or plant alive is required. Mm -hmm. So for all measurements, for all quantitative measurements, uh, uh, there, were, there were limits of, uh, of, of labor. And uh, this phenotyping system eliminated that or put the, put the limit much higher. So we can screen all uh, collections and then uh, the data accuracy and data consistency. Uh, when uh, you collect data with humans in the field, uh, they go in the field uh, uh, a few times per week, uh, if at all, and uh, the data density uh, is uh, not so, uh, so good and uh, mistakes can arise. Uh, the automatic phenotyping, uh, for example, with the Phenospex device, we are capturing data in this field uh, with our equipment because we don't have so many scanners, only three times per plant, but every day and every day of the week. So we have still three data points per day. And uh, the data points over time, we can connect them with, uh, with the curve. So uh, this gives us very accurate and very reliable data. Something like that was just unthinkable before. These are just uh, two things where we are profiting already heavily. And then it seems that uh, this, uh, this instrument is, 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 is really very helpful. When uh, we were st still under discussion, what uh, device to, to purchase and whether we should invest in phenotyping, um, not everybody in, in our institute uh, was convinced that this is a good investment. Now, the schedule for the use of this, uh, of this device is more than full. The breeding groups are competing in order to get access to the system. So this shows also that it is very useful. So it also shows that the salesperson did a pretty good job. Huh? <laughs> and also the purchase person, I think. Uh, these kind of things have to come <laughs> from both sides. <laughs> yes, yes, that was a, was a good match. Um, so um, getting back to topic, following up on the last question, um, what has improved? Is this improvement that you just stated uh, in regards to narrowing, narrowing down um, to a core collection, um, is, is that being used? Is high throughput um, plant phenotyping um, helpful in narrowing down the vast amount of your of your initial um, collection down to the core or even further because it, I can imagine uh, you need to screen a lot in order to narrow down to pick the good from the bad and to come up with a with a minimum subset of your original uh, population uh, we did not yet uh, use it in this sense, and uh, this uh, was also not intended. Uh, the way from the whole collection to the core collection is usually done uh, nowadays uh, by high throughput uh, sequencing, low density genotyping. And based on the genotype, uh, we define uh, a core set that represents the diversity of the large population. And then the core set is submitted to high throughput phenotyping. Uh, still, uh, phenotyping in a meaningful way, uh, let's say 9,000 pepper accessions in the field using this kind of device uh, is uh, too large for the device that we have. Our field is only 20 by 100 meters, so we can fit in, let's say, uh, three, 4,000 pepper plants, and this is just not enough for checking 9,000 accessions. As I outlined in my, in my presentation for checking, out, uh, for checking 9,000 accessions in a meaningful way, I would need uh, to test almost 300,000 plants. This is too big, this is yes. too big. So uh, we make the core collection first, then it is uh, the high throughput uh, phenotyping, and then either the identified uh, germplasm or the, uh, the germ identified having favorable traits is going directly in pre-breeding or breeding or is passing through physiology and through more uh, um, agronomical analysis in order to check uh, how useful it is. It depends of uh, the trait that we're interested in, it depends of, uh, of the species, but in fact it is in order to show us variation, useful variation in a reasonable sized uh, germplasm pool. Okay. So, um, 
last question from my side uh, at least um, um, since heat stress tolerance it's such an important trait um, for ex uh, example as you showed uh, for tomato um, did you already gather any experiences in the direction of thermal um, phenotyping active thermography or thermal imaging yes has that proven uh, helpful we did not use uh, we did not use uh, the Phenospec system for this purpose, uh, but we used handheld uh, infrared uh, thermometer for this. And we were calculating uh, the difference between ambient temperature and canopy temperature. And uh, we found uh, useful variation uh, in uh, the pepper collection. I did not show this data yet because uh, they Honestly, to me, they look a little bit too good uh, to, uh, uh, to, be to believe. I would like. No, they are. They are true. They are true, but uh, too good. Huh? I would like to to see this uh, replicated uh, yes. before before I really very enthusiastic. So uh, what we saw is uh, that uh, the plant material uh, that performed better had a canopy temperature that was two to three degrees uh, below the ambient temperature and the stressed material at uh, temperatures of amb ambient temperature or even a little bit higher. So uh, it was useful and uh, it is very high on my list to equip the phenotyping system also with thermal imaging. Okay. Then we have one comment um, from uh, Damoda, and um, it says that it would be great helping you with software measures for uh, organ development in vegetables, as you stated in your your presentation that this is uh, currently the state of of uh, uh, of research at uh, at your um, institution. So I'm posting again, like you already did, uh, your email address into the chat and people um, can take this in order to take up contact uh, for any collaborative means or whatsoever. Um, and uh, if that's okay. Yes, thank you very much. I am extremely interested in uh, collaboration uh, to uh, improve uh, the analysis in terms of organs. We were discussing this with scientists from uh, Phenospex and I think from there we also had very positive resonance. And uh, we uh, were thinking of how, uh, how to, uh, uh, to, uh, to approach that. And uh, if we can help, uh, can, can get help and collaboration uh, from colleagues, uh, we are very much interested in uh, in working on on this topic. It's highly okay. interesting to use, for example, artificial intelligence in order to figure out what uh, or which data point corresponds to a leaf and which one uh, corresponds to a flower or to a to a fruit. Yes, it's certainly also. Um quite recently very, very uh, popular in, in plant phenotyping to use these machine learning uh, and AI uh, software applications to solve problems uh, in image analysis or um, image segmentation, certainly. So we have uh, one question from Roland Piroshka. He asks, how do you deal with seed regeneration? Is it possible to do some basic phenotyping regeneration cycles uh, do you also do seed phenotyping um, seed phenotyping is also very high on our list uh, we are exploring uh, which system would be uh, would be useful uh, traditionally our regeneration uh, is done uh, according to gene bank standards uh, in the field uh, in appropriate isolation and uh, the seed is harvested uh, using uh, uh, best agricultural practices, etc. But up to now, uh, the only seed phenotyping that is done are germination tests. And uh, using image analysis, uh, this kind of work could be very much streamlined and uh, I mentioned that we are renovating our research infrastructure now through so building a, of a new uh, lab building and uh, uh, with a large investment in the volume of about uh, 20 million US dollars. And uh, 
during this uh, renovation, seed phenotyping uh, is one of the top priorities because uh, our center depends to a large uh, part of uh, the operability of our gene bank. And the gene bank wants to store quality seeds. So seed phenotyping is very important. Yes, there I can also highlight uh, connecting you with the seed phenotyping working group of uh, within IPPN or um, other working groups uh, within IPPN that would uh, get you in contact with experts in these fields um, where you are able to discuss uh, any matter in this regard. Um, and this might prove helpful in the process you just described. So feel free to uh, approach us. And uh, uh, and also I want to hint at uh, once more, we will be having our uh, biannual conference end of next year in October, the International Plant Phenotyping Symposium, which is of course also uh, a terrific uh, resource and um, uh, way of uh, connecting to, to peer researchers in any phenotyping field. Thank you very much. I will uh, forward the information about uh, the seed uh, phenotyping working group to our gene bank director. He is uh, the person in charge uh, for this kind of phenotyping. Yeah, this group is also in contact with a lot of uh, gene banks uh, around the world. So maybe, maybe this so he's already in contact. So he, he's already there. Great. So I have another and possible last question from uh, Damoda again. Do you have any experience with chlorophyll fluorescence uh, while phenotyping plants under heat stress? Uh, yes, we tried this in the past. Um, it is uh, very interesting, but we were not happy with uh, the throughput. It's too slow. <clears throat> And uh, it's also difficult to capture the reaction of the whole plant. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not have uh, experience in chlorophyll fluorescence measurement using remote sensing, uh, just by using uh, classical photosynthesis uh, measurement machines like, uh, like LICOR. And here it is a, a small part of, uh, of a leaf uh, that is used. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to be analyzed. And this uh, just does not tell uh, the whole story. So um, for a first screening or for, for, our, for our purpose, I find it more useful to check uh, growth and plant health uh, as thoroughly as often and over a, 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 a useful time in order to have a kind of integrated information about uh, photosynthesis. In fact, photosynthesis contributes to that. So uh, I, I, I get an information about how good photosynthesis is by measuring uh, growth. Yes, yes, because it integrates many, many um, aspects and realizes them through growth. Yes. Of course, once I have a germplasm panel, a smaller germplasm panel, and I have uh, plants that perform well and plants that perform less well, and I want to see what is the proportion of photosynthesis, what is the proportion of uh, carbon distribution, what is the proportion of contribution of other factors, then I would go to chlorophyll fluorescence. But that's the job then of uh, the physiologist. I see. On the smaller number of plants. All right, uh, then I want to close the discussion at this point. Um, once again, thank you very much, Roland. Um, it has been a tremendous journey to Taiwan and especially work at uh, the World Vegetable Center. Again, the contact details of Roland are provided in the, um, in the, in the chat now. Uh, it can be later on also uh, seen in the video that we will upload to our IPPN YouTube channel. The link you will also find uh, somewhere here in the text. I think Lisa posted it. And um, yeah, thanks also to the audience for listening to us. Um, see you in, t uh, in two weeks. In two weeks, we will, um, oh, sorry. Uh, in two weeks, we will uh, listen to a session, the first session um, for our phenomics webinars, a salinity session uh, with two speakers. Um, 
one from Wageningen University, Jasper Lammers, on how plants sense and respond to salinity. And our second speaker will be Miriam Avalia from the University of Cape Town in South Africa on genetic mapping of the early responses to salt stress in Arabidopsis thaliana. I'll be much looking forward to the session um, and I want to release you all into the weekend. Have a nice weekend and once again, thanks to everybody involved. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.